What's going on, everybody? It's Friday. We made it another week. We're getting back into the cool zone here. Just give uh, people a little bit more time to, to get in. <clears throat> Just watch a three minute ad to get here. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, there's no way for me to control um, the ads. Like I, I don't uh, have any ads turned on, but for, for um, people who aren't subscribed, when you first go to the link, like it might play an ad, unfortunately. <laughs> So I was still working on this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the the empire of Amazon. There's no way to escape it. Uh, so I'm still working on this grain tutorial. Um, made some some progress on like the way that this guy falls apart. Um, it's starting to look a little bit more interesting. Um, hopefully over the weekend um, I'll be able to finish up this record the tutorial, it might be a couple, two or three part, like, uh, YouTube videos or whatever, and then I'll put it up. It should be, um, pretty interesting, pretty fun. I think it made it a lot more, uh, before I just had the stuff, like, falling off very linearly, like a wipe. Um, but I think keeping, like, this kind of skeleton, uh, structure, the limbs or whatever, um, kind of eroding him, eroding him away as, as he's walking makes it more interesting. It's like he's falling, turning into sand. The sand man. <laughs> Steve GH, how's it going? So just get started with um, playing around here. So this, this is the cool zone. Any new people in here? Um, basically every Friday, this is the topic or this is how the stream runs. Um, it's just kind of sketching, making some kind of Instagram art or just playing around, drafting, I don't know, experimenting. Um, yeah, so we'll just start with the sphere right now. Um, maybe this buff. No who lie, <laughs> cool. Yeah, I kind of gave up on the Hulai stuff. It was um, just a bit too too much with my regular uh, job, and then doing this these streams, it was just it became too much to <laughs> to tackle. Um, so let's. <laughs> I don't even remember what day it is. What is this slow mode today? The tenth. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a bit. Um, also, just not being able to use like other geometry and stuff, it's, it just became too much to worry about. Yes, yeah, I, I saw you're still still getting the posts off, <laughs> Jeff. It's nice to, uh, you're a retired dude. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a good motivation and it's good prompts and stuff to, to get you thinking, but I don't know. I decided just to do a hard, a hard split from it. Um, so I'm just going to be making some abstract kind of stuff. So we'll just do a classic uh, curl noise and add it to the position. Boom. <laughs> there it is. Now this is uh... Alex. How's it going? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I saw the the side effects reposted my water um, uh, slow motion. I, I, that could have been a slow motion. Could have just done all my all the days of who lie in one single post. Um, yeah, so I'm just adding some curl noise. <laughs> this is, what is it? It's like 10 p.m., 11 p.m. there right now already. Uh, maybe we'll do more like divisions. Um, I have some rough stuff in mind, um, like just some ideas of techniques. Uh, basically, I'm going to be 
10. Yeah, it's pretty late. Bedtime. <laughs> um, yeah, I have some, some techniques and stuff in mind. I'm thinking of basically making um, some lines that are gonna be just swimming or moving through this noise field. Um, so I'm just setting up this. I'm not exactly sure of like the composition or a bunch of other stuff, but uh, just my, my main concept I think is gonna be something like that. Um, so let's try this other one. Could be cool. Um, then I'm just gonna use this to go from um, polygons, just remove the faces. So just turn it into points. And then um, if I want to do this kind of like a trail stop, um, we can do the same idea, but with this feed for, for loop uh, feedback. So if I put my noise in here, then I'm um, doing like 10 iterations. You can also just do this merge each iteration. So it will keep each each uh, copy, like each um, increment of the loop. So you can kind of see here, it's pretty cool. Whoa. <laughs> so this is kind of like um, doing a, a smoke or a, a pyro simulation, but you don't need to uh, run any solvers or anything like that. So it's pretty quick to, to build these uh, lines and stuff. And um, we want to connect them. It won't work that well. Because it doesn't, it like loses track of which one uh, starts where. This is pretty cool though. Sometimes you get interesting patterns because it's based off of like the topology of this. Um, can make our Windows 98 um, the mystify screensaver screen here. But um, if we want to actually build these curves properly, you can use this enumerate node. Um, this is just kind of a, it doesn't really do too much the node, it's basically just making IDs. So it just copies the um, point number to the ID or whatever attribute you want to uh, to call it. You can do some more advanced things if you have the piece attribute or stuff, but for uh, the way that I usually use it is just to make an ID attribute. Um, so now we can use that attribute over here. If we just do by attribute and ID, now we can build the curves. Just connect them based off of the ones that have the matching ID attribute. So you just assign it here first, and then when this runs each iteration, it uh, knows which which point comes from like which source point essentially. And you can add time to this fourth dimension fourth component um, to evolve the noise. Another thing that you can do that's a little bit more interesting, um, we're doing this on Wednesday with that fog, just distort um, the noise with that fourth component. So now you just have some more interesting warps or complexities in your, in your pattern. Um, it's kind of like if you look at wood grain, like you see knots or something in the wood. It's kind of like that. <laughs> Maybe it's kind of like Trump's hair <laughs> on a windy day. Um, and then if you want it super over the top or whatever, you can just crank this noise even more. It's pretty cool.
Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting to work this way. It's um, super quick. Like you can see changing all of this stuff. It's It uh, updates pretty quickly. Um, you can do this. Uh, it probably won't help me that much, but you can do this compiled block. Um, and then that should, it's hard to tell, but it should make things a little bit quicker. Um, basically, instead of like in memory, having to copy uh, geometry from this node to itself again and again, it can uh, share like the, the existing memory without having to, to uh, spend as, as much time just moving it around. Uh, this is a more advanced thing or whatever, so I wouldn't, there's certain situations where you wouldn't want to use them. Um, they don't work with like expressions, like uh, if I made expressions on these parameters, it wouldn't work. Uh, but for just doing kind of a linear uh, node chain, you can, yeah, they're pretty, pretty uh, useful. Yeah, with loops, I think they're most commonly used, but if you look at uh, even like the side effects tools, um, a lot of the newer HDAs or OTLs or whatever that they make, they'll have these even outside of loops. Like if you're just doing a long chain of operations, it can probably help your performance a little bit. So if I just change this uh, kind of time step or distance that things travel, then you could get longer lines. Um, they might start to lose kind of resolution at a certain point, but we'll, we'll see what happens. This, uh... I don't know. Something, I think it looks better if they're a bit smoother. A bit more more interesting of a shape I think if they don't get too gnarly you kind of have like some like a black hole or something like that it's like you're getting pulled into uh whoa <laughs> into a portion of the noise or something like that. So this, I've just cranked this stuff too high. Like, you get some bouncing um, jagged lines or whatever if you like noise is too high of a frequency in, in certain areas. It's probably stay away from that a little bit. Too, too high of a distortion. I think this is kind of nice. So I might just try instead of feeding this input as a sphere, um, maybe just starting from a disc or like a circle of, uh, of points, it could be cool. You could even do like a line. I don't know. It's looking too much like a mystify <laughs> screensaver again. Get back to something a little more interesting. Maybe this copy and transform. So I'm just using this to build, like, swing these uh, circles around. Kind of like a globe rotating on an axis or something like that.
some sacred geometry. So it's kind of hard just trying to figure out how um, dense or kind of sparse I want this stuff to be. Um, you can, I think I've showed this before, but sometimes it's nice to add this width attribute um, to your curves. So this way, if you go to the object level under misc, mis miscellaneous, um, you turn on shade curves then it's a quick way of just visualizing the curves with thickness. Um, you can build like poly wire or wireframe nodes in here, but this seems to be the quickest for the, the viewport um, to display because you're not actually like physically building extra geometry. It's just an OpenGL uh, trick, like a viewport trick. There's already some nice compositions some interesting stuff happening in, inside of here. Anyone else is doing the Hulai challenges in the chat? Jeff's the only one left. You're gonna be the only one getting the Iron Man uh, swag swag pack. If you last that long. <laughs> Yeah, just by like four days of it, I was already just exhausted. Whoa. Trying to do the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours trick in one month. You need uh, a lot of coffee. And <laughs> Are there even 10,000 hours in, in a month? Yeah, but the animals one should be pretty fun. That's probably like one of the best uh, best ones of the, um, I don't know, the fur, like uh, there's some, some interesting ones there. I'm just adding a little bit of roughness just to try to get like a bit more detail or something in there. How to make the geo, maybe creative texture and simple shapes. Fur and slime is okay, but scales I have no clue. Um, yeah, I'm not sure with the geo, there are some tricks. Like you go into the um, HFS, it's like the Houdini install directory. Um, and then you go to the help um, files, IFD workflows, ABC, bear, run. <laughs> this way you can get an animal. I don't know if it, if it counts as, uh, if this counts as um, working with stuff only inside of Houdini or not. But if you use this file path, um, Wherever you're using Houdini, you can always load this because this should, it's just an example thing from the help that uh, ships with Houdini. So I don't know. I'm going to try another thing. Um, this is still just looks 
I don't know, I'm gonna try to make it a little more interesting. So what I'm gonna do is modulate the frequency of, of my position with another noise. It's kind of cool with like a linear direction. Um, I don't know, it might not have been a good idea. It's a bit too, uh, too gnarly. Yeah, I'm gonna ditch, ditch that. I think it's looking a bit better if this stuff in the middle is like thin, uh, filled in. I don't know. This stuff's pretty cool, like the twist. Could be nice. Um, the thinner, thinner lines, maybe. Um, it's a, a ton of detail. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> this might just be too much. Starting to be a little, a little more interesting. So it's just pretty cool. You can uh, work so interactively, just doing this quick, quick uh, noise, procedural noise and stuff. You can just build interesting forms and stuff, uh, like almost in real time. It's pretty cool. This layering. So if you see some of these kinks, um, then just do like a resample um, after you convert things back to lines. And then just set these to interpolating. This is kind of like subdivision. It would be cool to make it flow around an object or besides, like it almost collides or maybe something constraining Geo. Yeah, that, uh, that could be interesting. 
let's uh let's see what happens maybe this is just a bit too too much So I just made my, um, e this is, I'm kind of thinking of this as an emitter. Like I'm basically doing a particle simulation here. Um, so I was just making these emitters smaller to get this um, more structured kind of shape. So this is starting to be pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I think, Let's just make like a field volume. Um, just put scatter some points in it. Maybe just like six points. Do this randomize. Um, get some interesting uh, scales. P scale. This should be ramp is usually nice. It's just a scalar, just one dimensional a float, not a vector. Um, and we'll just remap our, our range. So I'm going to try to make these spheres kind of uh, colliders or to, to manipulate the flow of things. Um, if you go into the curl noise, they have this, if you do other ones, like they have this collision SDF that it's meant to um, kind of embed like collision, I don't know, like <laughs> it's meant to embed like collisions in the noise field, but I've never had that. Uh, that much success with it. Um, I'm just gonna go more like from scratch. Just try a different distribution of things. Sometimes I take the seed for scatter and link it to the seed for um, this randomization. So this way I'm, every time I'm updating it, I'm getting new random outcomes from both of these. Like earlier, just the p the position of the spheres was changing, but the distribution of p scales was remaining constant. So, it's just something to be careful about. This way, if you're just trying to work quickly, you can get like more random outcomes without changing uh, two sliders. Yo, gamma bassoon. <laughs> I'm just making some abstract uh, flow lines, curvy lines, or whatever. Um, blasting them through this. I just have a curl noise function in there. Um, and then I'm just moving points through. This guy is collecting all of the iterations. So it's like 275 um, steps or movements through the noise field. And then I'm uh, adding them or connecting them um, just based off of the source point number, or point ID. So maybe this, if these guys are closer before they start. So I'm just trying to add some collisions or like some flow, some objects for, for things to flow around right now. Pearl noise graphics is all the hype. I mean, it's always, um, it's always, I think it's always going to be pretty, pretty hype, pretty hyphy. Like it's, um, just because it's meant to replicate like wind, it's always, you can always feather it, use it in certain, never, this is a, a pretty brute visualization that I'm doing of it, but uh, it's kind of like everything has curl noise or a bit of it in it, I guess. Um, let's just do a VDB from 
There's too many options <laughs> from particles. So because these already have P scales, um, I can just treat them like they're particles and build spheres instead of probably a bit quicker than like rasterizing, uh, or going VDB from polygons, like it's cutting out a few steps. Um, usually I'll just turn that down. Then this half band voxels can be somewhat important depending on what you're trying to do. Um, if I just slice through this volume to visualize it, uh, that half band is like how far from the spheres to start storing values. So it's just um, depending on what you're trying to do, you might need more half band voxels or more padding of the uh, SDF. And then this thing kind of expands a bit funky sometimes. Um, when you're working with these compiles, you usually want to add this and then just set it to fetch input. Um, this just indicates that you're using this input as part of your for loop. Like, otherwise it doesn't know how many nodes it needs to uh, include when it compiles stuff. And then uh, you can do that one as well. So now it's just a bit more organized. You can also color these. It's pretty cool. Just get all kinds of weird combinations. Have a fun time with that. It's pretty cool. Powerful. Um, yeah, so I'm just adding the SDF to the this input of my VOP. Um, so you can do sample to get the this value that I'm visualizing here. Um, it's going to be this input. We want to sample it from this current point position, and then you can get the direction. So direction will just tell you which way these values are increasing in or decreasing in, um, as the, this gradient is giving you that direction can be useful. So we just want to use the same file and the same sample uh, position. And then this primitive number, you can just leave it as zero, because we just have one volume in the input. Um, so we can do another add the direction. Let's just take a look. So it looks like things got a bit too springy. Um, that's just because this value is like too strong. Um, this volume sample here will tell you how close or far you are from the uh, surface. You might want to do like absolute value of it. Uh, to make sure it's a positive number and then a fit function. So now wherever this is zero, it will say that it's like the surface of that sphere. Um, maybe I don't I don't want to do absolute. Um, so we just want this to be fully moving things away from the SDF when uh, it's closest to them. Maybe this one normalize. Let's take a look. So it looks like it's going the wrong way. like this guy is, I might have, I think it was going the right way before, but I was just looking at the different uh, sphere. So let's get rid of this, just keep things kind of clean. Um, I think we can 
reduce that. Basically, we just want to only move things right when they get super close to the surface. Um, if you expand this too much, it's just going to be moving things from too far away. Um, I don't think we need an if statement. So because this is already like doing a bunch of iterations, uh, I'm kind of masking it and multiplying it. Like I could add this color to this fit function. So basically this white value is kind of like an if statement. Um, so only when the points are super close, will it start moving them away? Um, and then I think that this number here, one, is just too strong. Like my curl noise is a super subtle number because I'm taking a bunch of steps through the noise uh, or through this program or the function or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing the b best job of explaining this. Um, it's just a, a bit of a, a um, mystery, but, but this is I think I'm illustrating it a bit better now with these uh, visualizations. So basically this um, multiplier right here, this will just say anytime you're within this threshold radius of, of these, move away by this number, this value. Yeah, it looks cool. These could be like light sources or something. It's like some nice Elvis Presley silky hair or something like that. Very, uh, <laughs> very glamorous right now. Um, so maybe this distance. Looks like they're getting pretty, pretty nicely. Uh, the avoidance or whatever is working pretty nicely. one might be a bit weird. I don't know if I just need more. If you do it too high, then they, they're just kind of like ricocheting or bouncing off too strongly. Um, Maybe something, something like this is uh, starting to be better. If you want like the best performance or the best results, ideally your your um, amount that you're moving the position of of each of these points each each time through the loop, you want that like smaller. So if I do. Just a very small movement with a lot of iterations, then it's basically just able to sample um, the path that it's walking on, like at a higher rate, and get uh, better results. My noise. This might just be too small. Turn that off, the color visualization. I think it's working. Um, we'll, we'll just try a few different seeds. If I can move my collision stuff around. Um, just visualizing it, it looks like it's working pretty well. You can see there's still like some ricocheting, um, but if we want to like resample uh, and interpolate that stuff out, it will, it will get smoothed down. Um, but that's basically what I was talking about with changing the um, take more of these iterations and move slope more slowly through the noise and all these operations. And then it's kind of like doing a simulation with more sub steps. Um, you just have a, a more accurate result overall. Some of this might be related to the grid size. Like if I go, like possible, I don't think that's the case. 
might be. Like those are the size of the voxel. I don't know. I think it's good enough for for what I'm trying to do. Might go a bit lower just to uh, keep things moving pretty quickly. Just to make like the network a bit more optimized. And I'll just clean up this wiring. Um, so this right here um, is collision detection. And then this up here is just moving, um, blowing the position around using a noise. If you're thinking of this like a particle sim simulation, these are two forces. Maybe if we try like multiplying this curl noise, the amount that things move by another noise. I don't know, it could still be a bit too messy. You never use Vex? <laughs> I was using Vex uh, a lot more in, in other, um, other streams. For this stuff, um, curl noise, uh, it seems like the parameters are a bit more uh, controllable. Like there is a curl noise function um, with Vex, but I don't know if it layers the octaves as well um and then just layering these other parameters like these other uh, functions it's it becomes a bit easier i think for people to conceptualize or illustrate using bops like this you can do the same stuff with with vex pretty easily so i think if i just do like that t plus equals curl x noise this is like the simplex one um and then divide it or just multiply it by a smaller number. Um, we have a pretty similar thing. We don't have our collision detection um, or other stuff like that. This is pretty nice. So you can build this stuff either way. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just up to whatever you're more comfortable with. I'm starting to mix a bunch of different noise functions. Like I'll, sometimes I'll switch to VOPs just cause like remembering which frequency I'm adjusting and stuff. It's a bit easier for me to, to spatially visualize stuff. Yeah, I think it's very hard to know, like depending on how long you've used Houdini and stuff. Like when I was first learning, um, there were no wrangles, like you had to do everything in VOP, but, um, so I learned both of them at like different times and was able to really fully like learn both of them. Um, but it's still even for me, like it's hard to know when to use which one over the other. Um, just always seems like it's, sometimes you make the wrong decision it gets too complex. So I'm just going up in frequency with uh, this one. Some of the VOPs are a bit of a mess. Like, uh, I think the last weekend or whatever, I was doing showing this ripple solver, um, and just like what they were doing inside of it. Like, <laughs> some of this is just like, whoa, how am I ever going to? Uh, <laughs> like, I'd rather see this as code. Um, you can right click on it and do like this view vex code, but it is. Uh, it's just like a auto generated, so it's never going to be that clean um, or well like structured of of VEX code. So it's kind of like this is kind of useless to people at a certain point because it's like who's going to take the time to? It could take you a week to like properly comprehend what's going on inside of here. So that's just what you're mainly trying to avoid, whether you're doing VEX or VOPS, is just getting to too messy. I think that node is quite old, so they had to write it 
a bit more differently because there's just less uh, less wrangles and vex uh, available back then. Yeah, VOP that someone else made is pretty, can be pretty difficult. Uh, vex can be as well, just depending on how how uh, sloppy the code is written or like how well it's structured, like. I don't know, the, the way that you're doing variables and naming things, you could still make this into a pretty big mess. Um, but I usually, like, I wouldn't go that much deeper with my VOPs than this, just because this is still pretty pretty easy for someone to visualize and uh, figure out. Like, if it's something that someone else would look at for more than five minutes to try to figure it out, then it's better, I think, to move it into, like, a VEX code with the comments and stuff like that are a bit more... Uh, meaningful but again it just depends on like the team you're working with or stuff like that like some people don't know any programming or vex uh so it, it depends a lot on the situation and stuff i think that, like point six. i don't know about this Layering. I'm just trying to find a better form right now. Everything's still a bit too, too, too uh, chaotic. I think this. Something generally like this kind of frequency, I think, is looking, feeling a little bit better. So I don't know if maybe just making these collision gears smaller. more of them. Thinking like if I make more of them bigger, we can kind of force this noise to go through a certain path maybe. I don't know, it might just be too, too, too much. too much. I don't know, I'm still not really liking this circle. Like I'm getting too many weird hard hard edges and stuff. Let's just go back to the sphere. So you can always just bypass this ad. If you want to like double check the influence. Looks like it's gotten too subtle.
So I don't know, maybe uh, this kind of, I'm just changing too much stuff and just going back and forth too, uh, too quickly. I think it's time to, to start narrowing in on a form or an idea or something. It's pretty nice the way that this is set up that you can just kind of iterate or come up with different um, different shapes and different outcomes, visualize them and make decisions so quickly. This is like a particle simulation you were running, like would uh, take you days to do this many different uh, values and test them out, see what happens. That's starting, that structure is starting to feel pretty nice. I don't really like how, I don't know, doing it too, too many iterations, it's just stacking up, becoming too, too branchy. Like I think it's, it's more interesting, this more of a solid kind of form. Um, I'm gonna turn those ears off. See what happens. Just making them bigger. This is kind of what I was talking about, just like forcing forcing this noise to go through a certain path. Or something like that is uh I don't know, you start to get the more interesting shape overall. Might be too too big. Thank you, S2HS2H. <laughs> see, maybe going back to the circles. This is something, this is nicer. There's something going on now. You guys ever, <laughs> there's something happening. It's kind of, that's kind of like what I say to myself once you start making something that uh, <laughs> is like out of the ordinary. Like it's, this is interesting to look at now. Art direct that noise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of, uh, Kind of what we're doing with these this collision stuff is a pretty good idea to to push it around using it so we're able to force it to stay within a certain uh confining it within within a, a certain proximity or area or whatever um yeah so this is pretty cool let's just try to so i'm going to stick with this kind of noise settings um and i'm just going to play around with like the distribution of things. We can do less, um, just changing the like source kind of emission points. So now that I know I have like this bop or this program that will give me this pretty interesting result, um, I can go back to my emitter or the sources and just move them around and kind of work this way and get see what see what I get kind of like reverse sculpting <laughs> so I think it was better like more of a, a totem or a pillar maybe 
It's a little bigger. Whoa. So I think this is pretty uh, pretty interesting of a form. Let's start thinking about like a bonsai tree. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could uh, like sculpt a bonsai tree that way by moving obstacles and stuff around it. Um, start thinking about kind of rendering stuff. I'm just going to play around with the thickness of these uh, lines and just look, move my viewport around, kind of thinking like photographer, thinking what uh, direction or what uh, composition is going to be interesting. Try to get rid of. Sometimes, if you have this jagged lines, um, you can resample at a very low um, frequency, like low space, spatial divisions. Um, so, without this, and then with it on, kind of doing a smoothing. Um, and then resampling at the higher frequency or the higher value. Um, this is kind of like doing a smoothing operation. Uh, you can convert to NURBS. Uh, I find with like these curves, there's not too much of a difference. Um, the NURBS can be a bit slower with, with Houdini or with renderers and stuff like that. This is a pretty cool area of, of things happening. Um, might go up here and play around with this stuff. Something, I don't know, getting kind of close to things. I think it's going to be better with a situation where less is more. We'll just go back down with our emission amount. So you could do NURBS, but you can also do um, the blur. This one is a good good way to uh, smooth things.
All right, I think this is pretty good. So I usually switch my aperture to 36. Um, vary the thickness. I might do that. Yeah, I'm gonna maybe make some ramps and stuff like that. Um, so I usually do 36 for my aperture for, this is like a DSLR, or like a full frame sensor. I might just go like a wider angle. So usually, I, like now this is your lens in, in millimeters or whatever, if you work with a, a camera. Um, so if you keep your aperture at 36, then this is using like standard photography lenses. Um, if you start going like super weird with your aperture, then this these values kind of become meaningless. They don't correspond to like an actual lens size or whatever. So that's why I usually leave this at 36. And then these are like actual proper um, lens values. So we could try doing another randomize. Whoop. Doing another randomize. Um, but this time we'll do it with width. And then instead of set, we can just multiply the existing width but it looks a bit bad. <laughs> so for every point, we're coming up with a new random width value. Um, we were already storing this line ID or point ID um, and then connecting our, our points based off that ID. So this is now kind of the line number or line ID. So we can use it under options, seed attribute. And now each, um, each curve is getting a unique uh, random number. We might want to do the ramp again. This way you can just shape the noise distribution a bit easier. Maybe you just want a few longer ones, a lot of wispy things. be nice making it look easy <laughs> I guess it's a yeah I think just staying I don't know it's like certain knowing certain nodes in Houdini um, like certain combinations you're able to, to work in a simple fashion um, like if you don't know the right if you don't know all the, the nodes are the right ones sometimes like then you end up getting lost and like over complicating stuff um, but yeah, it just takes a long time, I think, to really find like good combinations of which nodes work work well with others or whatever. Um, what are we gonna do? So we could do <clears throat> um, texture. Maybe there's a, a few different ways. Like I'm, I basically just want uh, UV coordinates along these lines. Um, you can do it with these resamples. But you can also just do like another resample if you just turn off all these operations. Um, just just use that one. This way, it won't change the topology at all. Like it, I have two two million eight hundred thousand. 2,800,000, but it's just adding uh, this curve U attribute. Um, so now we can use it with a ramp, um, use it to make a color. Just do color, you do vector. Um, then when you make your parameters, it will know to make a color ramp. Maybe RGB. So now when I click that, it knows to make it a, a vector, like a color ramp. Um, if I delete these spare parameters and I don't have that vector, then it thinks you're trying to make like a black and white ramp. 
So that's why I wrap this around. It basically is just a hint when you uh, run that script, this, this little macro or whatever, um, so that it knows to make the, the data type. So this ramp is running along um, all these lines. So if we just do it like this, then like close to the start of the, the lines should be red and then the end would be white. Um, if we want the tips to change color, we can do it like that. Sometimes maybe going into constant might look a bit better. This is a big kind of Nike shoe, shoe color palette I have. I feel like earlier I was just stuck making this Taco Bell fast food color palettes. Now I'm doing just like Nike shoes. Some blue in here. Things are starting to look real patriotic. We got the 4th of July going on. Not for today, but do you know a nice way to make the lines grow? Maybe with the help of shortest path or curve view. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of ways. The easiest is just with this carve node. It gets a bit slow, but this one, um, Basically with these parameters, it's just setting the start and end point. It's like a percentage. Um, so if you just leave the start point at zero and you animate the end point, um, this way you could do an animation of them. Uh, there's faster ways to do it in Vex um, using like prim UV and those kind of functions, but the carve is... <laughs> It's a gem. Um, it's, a, it's just a simple node or whatever. It's, like I said, it's not the fastest, but it's, uh, it's a, the simplest way to make stuff grow. The carve is also nice because it will work with um, surfaces, like this, the way that the, the actual icon looks. Um, you do torus. Like, it doesn't work that well. Um, on polygons, but if you go to NURBS, uh, then it kind of can figure out like the um, size, the topology, or the, the area, or whatever. So you can do pretty interesting uh, things with NURBS and Carve. So it considers these curves kind of like NURBS, like it, that's how it can figure out the start and the end point a lot easier, or whatever. But with um, polygons, it just doesn't work as well. It's trying to do it like for each face or whatever. Spitting out gems. Sprinkling, raining raining down gems. Yeah, so the NURBS, these things with NURBS are, are pretty nice um, for just modeling simple shapes and stuff like that. We get back to our composition. I don't know, it's somehow I got too many colors. Yellow is a bit painted. So I think things are a bit disorganized. Um, right now because this curve view is like normalized. It's, it just goes from zero to one across the length of the curve. Um, you can convert it back to like a world space length if you do measure um, perimeter. So perimeter is the same as length uh, for curves. If it was polygons, then it would be kind of different, but for, for curves, perimeter is the same thing as length. Um, 
And then if I just move it, this measure puts it onto the primitives. So I'll just move it from primitive to point. Um, and then if I multiply curve view by length, um, this is a bit weird because it's going beyond one right now, so the ramp is repeating. But basically, the, these uh, ramp points now are lining up like visually um, based off of the length of the curve. So I think if I just divide it by a pretty big number, too big maybe. I think I'm doing it right. Um, yeah, so my numbers were too big. It looks it might have some precision or something, but um, I'm just trying to make it visually a bit more uh, clean, like based off of space. You can also just maybe just do this based off of like a world space noise. Didn't like that. Forgot a parenthesis. Uh, so this way, just based off of a noise function, I can color kind of like a leopard, leoparding or something. So these noise functions, you have to be a bit careful. Like they don't always generate numbers between zero and one. Um, I think that this X noise, I don't know, maybe it's O. This O noise, I think for sure, goes from like negative 0 0.5 to positive 0 0.5. So if I just shift it by 0.5, now I'm like halfway um, going between 0 and 1. Hey, Umer, I was just watching your abstract simulation R&D stream on YouTube. Yeah, this one is a <laughs> kind of similar to that. That one, the, that was you're talking about the one where I was making like the silly string, the little uh, ribbons. Need to go back to that folder and uh, crack that file open. I kind of left that like unfinished. Um, so I could just add maybe like a random number to this. Um, I can rename this as well to seed. So now I just have a slider to give me different noise uh, generations. If you want to change the frequency, you can just multiply or divide the position. So I think maybe a lower frequency, kind of a bit more organized. I don't know. No, I'm just going to keep making copies. Um, this is a good way, I don't know, not necessarily a good way, but it's a hack to just save your different options or whatever. I'm going to try doing my noise based off of the curve uh, length instead of world space position. So this, what I'm saying here is you can just like comment these out if you want to go back to earlier uh, decisions and just try out different outcomes or whatever. It's kind of like if you're in BOPS, like connecting the different wire to, uh, to the output.
I don't know. Something, maybe something like this. I think we're getting close. I think maybe this stuff at the start was uh, a better idea. Let's, let's stay with this. I'm just going to play around with these width, overall width again. I'm going to cash your sim and go to bed. <laughs> it's a good, always a good uh, thing to have something going, something rendering or simulating overnight. I don't know, maybe these, maybe these things thicker. Have a good night. Thanks for uh, hanging out, Alex. Yeah, I think maybe these like a bit thicker, kind of like a ribbon or something like that. Um, we have color. We don't really need to worry about some of these other things, but we have a color and we have a width. Um, I think I can go up here. You can do a new um, redshift render view. Always have a bad sleep when I'm rendering or caching. <laughs> yeah, I guess sometimes that happens. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and like want to uh, check it, validate that it's going okay, or like the worst is like fi finding a problem and then you're up for like an hour trying to like debug it and do it. But um, maybe rendering is a bit, bit more satisfying to sleep with going on because it's like less less can go wrong with it quick question can I ask any question related to your old stream here or not uh, if not so what other platform you will suggest um, you can ask it if it's like doesn't sidetrack too much like you can ask anything you want I don't know I'll probably ignore it if it's too try just try to answer it briefly if it's like too uh, too much down a different path. Um, there's the Discord link like in the panel right below this, this stream window. And there's a questions channel in that, that uh, for older streams or stuff like that. You can, for a longer form question or something, that's a good place to, to have that discussion. Uh, this will do a redshift light. Um, just move it around a bit. Just light things from the top down for right now. I think this, you could just ignore the viewport. Um, and then for rendering curves, you just do strands with redshift. We'll make a material. Um, and get the color attribute. And just, just start with it in the diffuse channel. So let's see what we get. Uh, doesn't look that good. 
<laughs> so let's turn on some GI bounces. Uh, make things a bit better. It looks like maybe it's not it's not finding my uh, variable my width attribute. It's possible, I think, with Redshift, like they've uh, hardwired it to be P scale. So I could just do rename width to P scale, and then uh, if I just hold down the T keyboard key and click on it, then I can render uh, with the attribute remapped to P scale, but keep my viewport looking at this node to uh, visualize it. So we'll see, I think this way, um, I should get the proper widths in both the viewport and the render view. Yeah, this one looks, looks to be better. I'm gonna try making my light bigger just to kind of get rid of the contrast. Um, I'm gonna make another camera as well. I'm just duplicating my camera to kind of save this current position. Um, and then I might just move around with it. I'll just turn off, I'm gonna turn off the lighting because that was like a little distracting. The redshift lights, like these RS lights, they don't always behave the best in the viewport. I think you've mentioned that you're using a tablet. How do you pan the viewport? Houdini is not tablet friendly at all. I don't use a tablet for Houdini. I'm just using keyboard and mouse. Um, I have a tablet like plugged in uh, on my desk, but it's not my uh, like if I go to draw something on the paint application or whatever, I'll switch to it. But I, I don't I don't use it that frequently. Houdini seems a bit difficult to use every any time I've tried a tablet with it. Um, like it will just. If you click, I don't know, because it's so like context sensitive of moving the mouse around, it just, uh, I've never had that much uh, joy or success from, <laughs> from using a tablet with it. So let's go back into here. Um, maybe just add some roughness. <clears throat> I don't know if maybe... Oof. Greetings, Mr. Wazo. <laughs> Made it to, into the cool zone. I'm making a bit of a, a bit of a mess right now. Uh, I think my colors. I'm not really vibing with the colors too much. I might go in and change them. You can also, um, if you go back to these strands, maybe like cylinder or capsule, you get more dimension, three-dimensional type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, this is like an Italian soccer jersey or uh, was it was, was uh, feeling a lot like a Nike color scheme or something earlier. Let's turn that. Stop updates on. Um, might still have to re restart the renderer. Um, I'm just trying to get the tubes to show up. Usually takes <clears throat> a bit longer to start rendering. It's like slower for the renderer to build tubes out of your uh, geometry. It's still going. We might have uh, we might have borked it. So we built our tubes. They look better, but they're uh, slower to render. You do um, 
less like subdivision or less tessellation and uh, like this this one I'm kind of using to up res or up sample my curves I'm going to turn that off Let's just try some different uh, go to some of our different color options very Italian right now. <laughs> it's like the Cornell box uh, color palette as well. <laughs> but Dava is rendering a, a Cornell box and uh, the producer or whatever was looking at my screen. They were like, are you a big uh, fan of Italy? <laughs> He's like, I don't, I didn't understand for a little bit what they were uh, talking about. I don't know, these colors, I think I just need to go into my color palette library. <laughs> these fine books. Yeah, I don't know, it might be better. Too, everything was too saturated. Now we're back in the Miami Vice. We're back in the, we're in the cool zone. We're back in Wave Race, playing Wave Race 64. So I don't know, we'll see if it's, it should be a little quicker to build these um, tubes. Now that I turn the set settings down, we're in the vapor wave. We're in the vapor zone. So I might, uh, might drop the width overall down. Um, I'm going to stop doing these t cylinders for a little bit. It's like too slow. Things. This is a pretty cool uh, composition, maybe. Let's just try to get some better colors, better uh, distribution. Back at Method, we had a whole pitch for Adidas with stuff looking real similar to this. Color was nice, just grays, dark blacks, occasional pops of teal and white lines. Yeah, I'm I've been doing different color methods, maybe doing it by um, just primitive number like line number might be better. Um, just keep just copying a bunch of different uh, functions here. We could just do um, clear that out and then just do a random from the trim num. Maybe I want to add the, uh, the seed parameter to it as well. Maybe, I don't know, let's try um, just going to try to build like a uh, back background cyclorama type of thing.
it a bit too too but <laughs> too small, too dark. Um, maybe this is it's nice. Let's try moving the light up. See if we can light the stuff up a bit more. I don't know. I think my uh, my tube is not working too well. I'm just gonna do the uh, dome. So this is, this is kind of like a hack to just make the background color. Seems like my material is a bit off. I don't know if we want it like more reflective or less. Maybe <clears throat> turning this backlighting on. It's getting pretty dreamy. Be too much, too much backlighting. I don't know, could be cool. Like a, uh, what's that painter's name? Georgia O'Keeffe. It's kind of like the, the flower, flower paintings. Sometimes like the hardest part of making abstract art is choosing an angle. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's also hard just because it's so easy to like keep changing your mind. <laughs> like sometimes when you're just given a shot with a camera locked and like that isn't part of the decision making process, it uh, becomes easier. I don't know, I think that camera I had earlier might have been working better. Let's try to go a little bit closer to that lens length. This is kind of roughly what I was doing before. It's always, it's, I think it's just hard because you're like trying to make, you're trying to establish the focal point. Um, Sometimes it's like you don't have enough stuff happening. 
like your your geometry i don't know it's tempting to want to go in and change the geometry yeah this instagram square <laughs> this thing is something's happening here um mash that depth of field Something, I don't know, something like this is... I don't know if my click, click to focus seemed like it was broken for a minute. Turn this stuff off. Um, so I think this is working pretty well. Uh, just save the scene. <laughs> we made it this far with the untitled scene. The click to focus is, seems a bit buggy. This redshift render view overall is just like a bit buggy in Houdini. Um, but yeah, it seems like sometimes I'll, it's just weird how it's like a button, but it doesn't stay toggled. I think I don't know. It's, it's a bit, sometimes it's cursed. It's the feds, the, the FBI agents don't want you to uh, render depth of field. We'll do today's date. Oh my God, the 10th already. What the hell is going on? So I saved it. Um, I'm just gonna go in again with some of this, uh, move my emitter around a little bit. Inspirited me. <laughs> you, you were inspirited by the feds. So I'm just moving my uh, emission stuff around to see what happens. Um, I don't know, it's like, maybe we want a bit more chaos, but still like a strong, I feel like this direction is, is really nice. Um, this, that could be nice. We'll see. Let's see, I think I have too many, I guess it's still not too bad. It's like two million points. Let's see what happens. It's like it could be maybe a Dove soap commercial here. It's a very it's, we're back in like hand sanitizer area of things. That's no, it's definitely a little bit better. Um, let's jump jump back in the light. I might go smaller with this light. Let's see which is the camera I'm looking through. Um, try to move the light to help us direct where you're looking. I don't want to do that. Sometimes with these lights, um, turning the spread down, this way you can like focus, you're not lighting up as much stuff, basically. It's like more of a, it's kind of like a spotlight, but for for area light, um, it's like the, like the barn doors or whatever on the side of your your lights on on a film set. 
you can just really use them to punch in like an area of interest. Do you have a usual go-to on the amount and type of light you use for your setup? Um, not particularly. So, I mean, sometimes just trying out different options. Like sometimes I'll just take, I don't know, it's kind of hard because you don't want to like switch too much. Um, sometimes I'll just approach, like open up the file and just try it, relight it from scratch without um, starting. Like that. that's, I don't know. It's a good approach sometimes. So this dome light is just doing a background color, um, but I might do another light dome here. Turn off the background for this one. Um, like I have some HDRIs, sometimes I use them. Um, you can get like ones that are studio lighting style. Um, Sometimes just trying out, like flipping through HDRI files. Um, the dome light is simulating like a full 360 degree environment. So you usually, you get more natural lighting because it's like less, less directional. Um, it's, uh, it can be good as like a starting point or to, to flip through ideas pretty quickly, but you can't really edit them like you'd have to edit the actual image and stuff. So that's why I, I, I don't tend to use them. Um, the area light or spotlights, you just have a lot more control over. So you can really like dial stuff in if you're looking for a specific outcome. Um, some people would use a dome for hero shots. It depends like, again, if you're doing um, motion design, you probably like the more that you care about how the light is hitting things, the less you want to use a dome light because those are just harder to control. Um, and then so it, it depends as well. Like sometimes for reflective surfaces, you want to use a dome light because it's just easier to get like nice looking reflections and things. But um, just seems <laughs> maybe like an endless, uh, I don't know, lighting and, and doing stuff with the camera, it's always like a bit tricky. It's like there's something you haven't thought of that's changing one aspect of it is like, oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't remember, like I could be projecting a texture or projecting a, a gobo or something right now into things to get like shadows being cast. Um, and that could be cool. Like there's just kind of endless possibilities. Uh, so especially doing like these abstract explorations, it's more just about like what's quick, what's quickest for you to try out different uh, designs, different compositions and stuff. Yeah, lighting is, uh, I mean, that's why the dome light is there. So you can just use a texture and forget about, it just simplifies everything. Um, but if you want to have like lighting that stands out, um, sometimes you just have to go in with the, the grid lights and stuff and really uh, move move things around. I don't know, it could be better on black. The white was starting to feel a bit cheesy. This is kind of nice. I don't know. It's yeah. It's just about like how your eye is moving through the the picture and whatever tool you can use to control it. The best is uh, the best way to go.
It's always weird because you're working like the light and the camera work together to to control all that stuff. So it's always like hard to know whether to do just what settings to change. Even even photographing stuff in real life, there's just like you have like the three options or whatever the um, shutter time. Like ex I, I guess it's kind of like a triangle. You have like the aperture size, the shutter time, and the uh, I don't know, I'm forgetting it. What, someone, someone help me out. ISO, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's even with those options, like you have f-stop I'm saying is aperture size, uh, right? Um, so, so it's hard to, uh, even with those three factors, you, you find out you never really have stuff uh, like fully, I don't know, controlled or whatever. These are the, you, these are the style frames you're giving me to to base this off of. What is all this stuff? Future Deluxe, they're pretty good. Yeah, this stuff I think is super. This is kind of like what I was doing with the skulls, um, the white and gold color palette. Some glitter is pretty cool. Lots of sports references. This is kind of what I would, yeah. So it's pretty cool with this symmetry. Yeah, I think these ones are really nice. This one, I think, is probably the best best frame. I think I got a bit too uh, too dreamy with that depth of field. Nike Flyknit vibe. Yeah, it's a little, uh, we're still kind of in a shoe color territory. Let's uh, just keep playing around with this light, see what happens. Whatever reason, like I was saying, this redshift view is a bit buggy. Like whenever I go into um, resizing it, it uh, stops my auto update. This is starting to be pretty nice. Might be um, too just too too squished into the top of the frame there. Maybe doing a wider angle. It's starting to get the depth. Yeah, I don't know. I think that my light is uh, too. Too, too far in that area. Wow. <laughs> I think I, uh, yeah, I am on. I went back to uh, over black. I turned off the white background. I think it's just a bit odd having that stuff so bright back there. Um, back into the light. I think I just, my view wasn't locked before. I 
this could be nice. I don't know. Thinking maybe this selected the wrong light there. Spread. Just a real a real beam hitting stuff. Slam that saturation. <laughs> Give me all the colors. <laughs> I don't know. Let's maybe just try the spread a bit wider again. Love slamming the saturation. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. It's useful sometimes. That's something that you need uh, the right amount of restraint over. When I was starting out, I, I like I just overused it all the time, and then my whole portfolio or all my renders were just looking like a the colors. It's easy to get carried away with, but but yeah, you definitely want um, like something vibrant like this. I feel like you want them popping. You want these cheeks clapping. Let's just go back into the shader. Did someone say cheeks? <laughs> So I'm just kind of switching between different uh, materials, like a paper to a more uh, metallic thing, but I think that's this kind of paper diffuse, uh, dreamy kind of vibes was working the best, kind of like sub subsurfacey or something like that. What do you think is the hardest area of the effects industry? Um, I mean, are you talking just about like doing effects, like the hardest effects task or the global visual effects territory? I think it's a it's effects. I think like the doing fluid solvers, anything flip or pyro with like a pretty big shot, it just becomes the most difficult because it's so slow. You have to really know like the settings and stuff that you're doing. Um, I think that's the hardest area to kind of master. It takes the longest. RBD destruction? I don't know. I, I've always thought that that's... Uh, that to me... I don't know yet. Yeah, RBD is like technically very difficult, I find, like to manage all the data and the names and pieces and stuff. But... Uh, in terms of like getting a good, I don't know. It depends, but it's definitely kind of two different sides of uh, of things in my experience. Like food simulations, it's a bit more zen. It's just like simplifying, getting the forces <laughs> behaving properly. And then RBD is like, you're out in the geometry spreadsheet all the time, like uh, looking at name piece attributes and counting primitives and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I've seen uh, Keith's stuff. His, his uh, training stuff is pretty good. I'm going to try moving my focal uh, point around a little bit, I'm trying to get it like a bit closer uh, to the camera. Um,
I think it was it's a bit nicer now that I got that uh, that other thing out of focus. Very flowery. It's uh, I don't know. Save it. Get a new version. After following going through all streams, I realized Houdini is not made by aliens. It still might be. <laughs> some some areas of it are were made by aliens. So um yeah, let's try maybe some different colors. I don't know. <clears throat> This is a bit more organic. You're not convinced humans made this software. It's uh, getting some nice specular now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the alien who made it. It's a weird. Th I mean, it's very wild to think that, like the late '80s, it was. Uh, he must have been visited by aliens. <laughs> To know that just like node-based stuff was the future. Yeah, I think this is feeling a bit more uh, interesting. Um, I'm gonna try going back here to tubes, cylinders, see how slow it is. But uh, yeah, just to know like procedural, like node graphs, like in that era, everything was just kind of like Photoshop, like you had your viewport. Um, to make prisms and like to have the, the, the foresight is pretty impressive. Even basic modeling the node based structure that makes things easier. Um, yeah, it's, I think like laying it out the way that they did kind of like a file system, like it's almost like it's its, its own operating system or whatever, like super, super uh, impressive having like cops like an, you have an image editor you have a renderer you have a chops is like a little synthesizer or signal processor like you have a whole supercomputer kind of at your fingertips they just need to make it faster and more stable now yeah i think these i don't know these tubes tubes feel a little better the strips just feel a bit uh I don't know, when you see the edge, edges of those strips, it just looks a bit odd. But this is looking even better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that's why I'm saving these files going up in versions or whatever. So just kind of um, just visually visualizing the wrong one. Uh, just kind of like keep experimenting. There's no, uh, as long as you're saving progress, there's no wrong buttons you can push. Um, try to get some bits of red in here. Some shades of orange in here. Is it shades of orange in the chat today? I feel like I'm working in a weird color space now because I'm like, just boosted the saturation so much. 50 shades of orange. This is a little bit closer to the some Adidas or Nike stuff again. <laughs> so let's uh let's just go back into this light. I feel like the depth of field is pretty Working pretty well now. I don't know, this is like, somehow this got super slow to update, it looks like. Yeah. I think with the, changing this as tubes, I guess that's a bit quicker now. It's kind of interesting. Thank you. 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm, the new Nike Air Coons. Somehow it's... I haven't made any up, good updates with my light. It is red. Sometimes it's nice to turn the spread really narrow to, to choose where you're aiming it. Like it's, it's easier to see where you're centering it on. And then you could kind of move it back a bit to uh, expand things. very mysterious now, like very intriguing. Let's go back a uh, bit and spread. You like the Miami version on white? I don't know. It was feeling a bit too cartoony for me. It wasn't uh, wasn't dramatic enough. I still have the, I still have the node. Can swap it out. Um, maybe let's go back. See what happens maybe with that um, back over white. Yeah, I don't know. I've been uh, enjoying like some kind of Rembrandt styles recently. So, like, I guess that's one. This is kind of one way to get away from the Instagram square is by going over black and then really. Uh, windowing windowing the frame a bit just to I don't know that's one way to to break the box break the square the Netflix C series trailer I haven't uh, I don't know if I've seen that it's almost I don't know this blue and orange is kind of like the inside of the body like veins or something blood vessels I think it's starting to be pretty good. Um, I don't know if my light is overexposed. Let me try to get it still uh, a bit more focused. strand in the foreground is distracting this big one right here you think I think as long as we have a black it's uh, it, it doesn't really distract it kind of keeps I don't know I think it kind of keeps your eye from like wandering into that corner they didn't post any stills This isn't Netflix, it's Apple TV, right? But yeah, I guess I somehow ended up with this kind of lighting scheme, very uh, 
just illuminating certain portions of it. It's pretty cool at the end. Pretty uh, nice dynamics and stuff like that that they have on it. I don't know what uh, what what type of material that's meant to be. It's kind of like a wax or something. We could try something without this strand in the foreground. Um, just gonna try going back up. More of a zoom zoom lens. Try to get this. Maybe uh, a bit looser on the, the depth of field. I don't know about this red. Let's go back into white. See what happens here. I don't know. I think it was, uh, took a step back with that one. I'm just gonna go back to strips. Um, so it will update quicker. I don't know. This is, the strips might even be looking better now. Um, I think we need some, something with some warmth to kind of balance this blue out. Getting closer to the Miami Vice territory. <laughs> See what happens here. Back in the Baja Blast uh, area of the cooler area of the drink fountain drink station. <laughs> I think it was better having this thing getting a lot of yellow in there. Um, I don't know, maybe this was nice with like a reddish orange. Just try to sprinkle some more in. The blue one a second ago was really nice. Thank you, Tim. Uh, you think when I was in the Baja Blast territory, it was like a Mountain Dew. Let's see what? Very refreshing. It's like a cool, cool summer vibe or something. Blue noodles. <laughs> it's very like a candy or something. Turned off my AC, don't need it now. <laughs> We're all in the cool, cool blue zone today. I don't know if this. It's kind of like a wave, a blue wave or something.
feel like this vignette never uh, never gets intense enough for me. Um, let's try maybe going back to the wide angle. I don't know, maybe somewhere in between. It's a bit nice with this uh, sweep, swoosh thing kind of happening. Like a S, S curve. save it a new version and uh, I don't know I'm gonna a bit odd with this black That's the best part about the, the the Instagram resolution. If you render it like 2K or 4K, you can just crop, make nice like anamorphic crops or whatever from it. I was always going into the aspect here and kind of making it like a anamorphic, like the, the bokeh or whatever will be uh, elongated, uh, squished or whatever in the background. Um, maybe. Gonna try a bit wider. prominent. Yeah, I don't know. This is, is feeling pretty uh, pretty good. I might just try a few different widths, like global width uh, amount for these curves. It's like super delicate. Maybe something a little more bold. thick thick boys in here it's definitely a, a bit more like the noodles udon noodles or something now thick <laughs> yeah it's it's i think it's a reads a bit better with, with them thick but uh might have been too much get, get a bit more uh contrast and shadows and stuff with them like this This seems to be better. It fixed a bit of the penetration or whatever. I don't 
know, sometimes that it's a bit wonky if your your aspect is like super thin. Super creamy. I think something like this is cool. It's easy to go over the top with that f-stop. <laughs> Just do super big aperture, super big uh, wide aperture. Yeah, this is starting to feel pretty, uh, pretty fresh. Might leave it here. Getting close to leaving it. Um, we'll save this version four. We've got a few interesting iterations or, or compositions or whatever. Worthy of a cool zone. Could I get a W question mark? Any W's in the chat? Yeah, I think this worked out somewhat well. I don't know. Um, these colors here is a bit just clashing too much. Like, I don't know if I was to do one last thing, I might just cycle back through these. These uh, earlier settings. Just see what happens here. Um, it seems just a bit too blurry, like with those overlapping colors. This blue. Whoa, <laughs> we're back in the drink. This is like the uh, <laughs> like the drink that uh, Robert Downey Jr. drinks in the Zodiac. He has like those glowing blue uh, fishbowl tropical drinks. Go Dolphins. Yeah, I don't know. I think um, like a very nice royal blue. You're the feds. <laughs> they were alerted. They tried to thwart me with uh, the click to focus, but I, I outsmarted them. Yeah, I don't know. We have the, a few different blues. I don't know how well they're going together. Whoa, got back in the pasta. Um, I think just overall my saturation was a bit out of control. Toxic pasta. Yeah, this is a bit more more edible now. Uh, we're back, this is the organic pasta. I might just add some numbers this should be giving me maybe I have to do a decimal number um, just to offset like this ramp try something a bit higher frequency very uh, 
kind of mid mid Samar, like Ariaster, Ariaster, Ariaster. Um, back in that flowery kind of uh, territory. What a be bezier on the color ramp. Um, I'm not doing one right now. You think it would be nice? Bezier. Yeah, it might be nice to uh, just transition a bit more subtly. The constant stuff, it just becomes a bit clamped. <laughs> very pasta, very pastel. Yeah, it's, I was like t way too saturated earlier. I think this these pastels are a bit uh, more natural. Cotton candy. Got our, it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's either very flowery or candy and delicious. Um, bubble, yeah, it's like the, uh, bubble, uh, the thing that came in like the tape measure packet. It was like a big roll of, uh, big league bubble tape. Yeah. Measure, let me just get my measuring tape of bubble gum. I don't know, I think like a green, light green with a um, pastel, like yellow, red. This, this is pretty nice. Sour apple. <laughs> Thank you, Zen Ronin. Yeah, so this is just the Friday for this stream. We do a uh, cool zone. An adventure into the cool zone, make something abstract, some generic Instagram art or something. <laughs> I don't know if black is uh Yeah, pretty pretty good. Um yeah, so I'll save this one more version. Um, and I think that's going to be it. Pretty, uh, pretty far into it today, two and a half hours or something. Some, some cool, cool experiments. Um, but yeah, I think this technique overall is just super cool for moving, pushing curves around, pushing points around, and then connecting them. Um, you can just sculpt a lot of different forms and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a, bit, a little late, but uh, you, there's the VOD, or I, I post the files, um, the scene files in the Discord. So the VOD is available, um, and then on my YouTube channel, I think it's just like the channel name on YouTube is John Coons. Um, I repost the VODs on there so they don't get removed after the 45 days or whatever. Um, yeah, so it's a good, it's a bit, bit rambling in long form or whatever, but it's cool to see the, the process. But yeah, this, just this curl noise functions, these feet moving the spheres around inside of it. Um, seems like a pretty good, good technique. You get some interesting forms and stuff like that. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, have a chance right now. Um, probably end it soon so i'm using these spheres to uh push like conform the noise to go in a certain direction endless possibilities. Um, I don't know if you would create hair using this technique. You can do it 
kind of using somewhat similar stuff. Um, but this this can be useful. Like so, we just get our guy, um, famous Tommy, in here. Um, fiber optic scene of some sort. Yeah, all the Behance links that Umer was passing around, like this is a pretty good base for, for a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, if we wanted to do like some hair kind of style, we got our nice uh, androgynous, <laughs> our nice gender fluid uh, boy in here. Um, we'll do a clip just to decapitate him. <laughs> um, So what, one thing you can do, I think, is like, this is the same thing that I was doing quite a bit early on at the start of these streams. Um, do a sphere to uh, just decide like a point position, pretty much. Um, this is going to be like the top of his head. Um, And I'm just gonna move it closer to like his forehead. Something like that. Uh, so then if I do a sort node, um, I just wanna sort it by the proximity to that sphere that I put down. Um, I could just copy relative references. I just do it with a sphere because then you can visualize it a bit better and you have like a transform handle. Um, if I wanted to move move it around this way, it's easier to place things. Um, oof, how many hotkeys there? So now if I um, do like find short, shortest path, or there's also the newer one that's like distance uh, along geometry. Um, this one, you can get a distance from this starting point. Um, it, these things aren't connected right now, so it's ignoring them. Um, but that's okay, we don't need the other stuff. I could even get rid of, uh, you do like the nine key, then you can group, uh, select by group for like connectivity and stuff. Uh, ooh, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Just keep the, the inverse of that, the opposite. Um, I'm just gonna do that step earlier. So his like mouth, there's like a bag inside of his mouth or whatever, but we could ignore it for now. Um, so you can use this color value and kind of like we were doing with that SDF, like the volume gradient. Um, if you do polyframe, you can use this to get the direction that that fall off is going in. Um, you just do attribute gradient, and then that is getting stored in dist. Um, I think these are a bit too hard to visualize. I think it will... End of class bonus right here. <laughs> it's a quick one. Um, so I think the best way to do this is uh, if you do like color, um, ramp from dist. So now we're kind of visualizing that fall off. Um, yeah, of course, I'm happy to, to share. There's an end of, end of uh, stream gem coming in right now. Uh, so we do this gradient of color and this way, maybe if I do the D, E, um, just gonna make these normals shorter. I might wanna do, I think it might store tangents. So now you can see these are moving away from that position point. So if I move this sphere, uh, like up or down the uh, direction of those will point basically towards the sphere. Um, so what I can do with this is like, 
if you do VDB uh, from particles, um, this is just an easy way to make like a vector um, volume. Like I'm basically converting that uh, I just need to promote this. So it stores it on the vertices. Uh, so if I promote it from vertex to point, um, I could change this new name as well to V for like velocity. Um, and then if I store this V, usually for volumes you store it as Val. Um, now if I look at his face, maybe I'm just going to take um, this section. Got kind of a bit of a unibrow or something. Um, we'll just isolate those. Then if I do a scatter, um, then you do this advect points. <clears throat> and then you do streamlines, maybe some more sub steps. I don't know if you need more. Um, I think my resolution for this volume is just too low. So what I could do with this is use it as like a flow field um, to make eyebrows or something like that. So if I consolidate this down, I don't know. I'm not that good. There's like shortcuts for selecting edge loops and stuff, perhaps a little bit better. Um, we'll just keep those areas. And you change the time step. Um, that's just how long this stuff will travel through the noise. Um, so if we just go back to the top one, um, you might need to change like you change that force a little bit more, or um, if you just do the peak node, uh, this way you can just move it up away from the surface a little bit. Maybe like this, add, um, remove unused points. Also, color. Give him some hair, hair color. Uh, it's kind of like a starting point. It's not, <laughs> I've really gone in there with a bad razor, but this is if you just want a super quick and dirty way of like um, sculpting some facial hair. I think this kind of way can work pretty well. Um, but for longer hair, like on the top of his head or something like that, it might not always work that well. Um, but yeah, it's, it can be nice, like doing stuff like this. Um, you could add some noise to it if you wanted, like some some other directionality to it. For like facial hair, like a beard, you can get some interesting kind of natural directionality to that as well. Um, yeah, so that's one other way to kind of use this, like streaking trailing points through a noise field or through a uh, vector field to grow hair or facial hair interesting all right that's gonna be it for today maybe this will just be eyebrow um yeah so keep up with the schedule see see people tomorrow uh thanks everyone for hanging out Doing another cool zone, another success, uh, another nice image is always a win. I uh, hope everyone enjoys the their Friday, the start of their weekend. All right, later. <laughs>